morning morning evening how goes it i guess we're still figuring it out good morning ajay morning good morning people Give me a second here as I um, let people in and then I'm going to share my screen. I actually didn't know how I joined this group. I got an email, but I don't know what was the connection. So yesterday I saw Krishna's email. Okay, now I realized, okay, this is from that boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> because nowadays you get... all kinds of slack channels and discords so you don't know how we get into join these groups yeah well i would say you know it probably started with you you wanted to get better so you felt <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I always have a study yeah yeah i mean i think um i think we have a pretty good size you know of people coming in i know um you know it's often sometimes like some people can't make it sometimes other people come you know and it's their first time um but it's okay you know i think like this stuff is going to be you know on youtube anyway so you can always just kind of go back and look at it and then we always have the channel where you can come and talk about things you know if you want to continue to have the discussions so we've got something going and then i think amelia has a good job of the note taking so um what reminds me let me bring that up um okay yeah so uh, i think basically uh we finished chapter 1 last time and at this point we're on chapter 2 we thought about moving around and going to chapter 6 but i think for um because like how people kind of you know join and join infrequently i feel like it would be better if we just kind of continue to work in series and get to those chapters um but by all means feel free to read ahead anyway you know cuz it'll make you more prepared i've heard some people have read the entire book you know and then other people have definitely like read more chapters than the one that we've done i just want to like make sure that we just kind of like get through each one so that we like you know there's no questions about anything yeah. what do you all think i read this chapter i think uh, it's pretty useful for subsequent chapters uh, yeah this this is i mean maybe the intent of this chapter was something else but uh, i learned a lot about abstractions why we create abstractions Mm-hmm. uh then the decision of uh, processing the data on the client side versus server side so yeah exactly. that's pretty insightful yeah this one was a pretty good chapter in my opinion too i got a lot out of it um yeah we can dive in let's do it um anything else though before i do that does anybody have anything to ask no that's okay. No. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Um there also may be noise this morning because um I'm near like a race track. So I might have Amelia like lead the discussion and then I'll jump in. Is that okay? Mm, okay. So I I kind of rushed through this. I'm not um I don't uh, I'm not prepared for this meeting, but uh, let me see um what I can <laughs> yeah I, i would rather have somebody else speak if they have already um, you know chat, read the chapter thoroughly i didn't so i want to listen more than talk just for this one next session i'll take it yeah no problem um i'm going to switch locations really quickly just cuz it is pretty loud so just give me a second here
Yeah, so I, I've never been, uh, I mean, um, th this is talking about low level um, data, uh, data modeling, which I don't have much experience and, you know, uh, so this chapter is kind of uh, newer thinking for my brain. So I would rather listen than talk. Okay, yeah, no worries. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So actually, you know what? I think I can lead it. I think I've moved to a smaller room here. So uh, if it gets loud though, like I'll have, I'll just ask if anybody else wants to switch. Anyway, sure. uh, so, so chapter two essentially is about you know, data models and query languages, right? As you can tell from the title. Um, you know, I made a lot of highlights in this one because there was so much like you were saying you know, there's so many um, interesting parts to the chapter. And, you know, I just kind of felt like, um, like you were saying, uh, Srini, I think um, basically that, you know, um, it is all about abstraction. It is all about, you know, just kind of thinking about how to move things from just being, you know, um, just kind of like, a problem solved for one specific architecture to a problem solved for like all architectures, right? Like just kind of, um, you know, that's the thing with the web, right? If you think about, you know, how like we make an internet request, right? Like we have the application layer. I think maybe you guys may be familiar with, um, you know, the different layers. I think there's a whole bunch of them, application layer, Then there's the TCP I level. Um, yeah, OSI model, that's correct. So this is kind of like in the same vein. Um, you know, like if I go to the OSI net model, there's like seven layers, application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, physical layer, which would be the hardware, right? So this is kind of something that, you know, I was reminded of. Um, in the same way that, uh, you know, basically this chapter kind of lays out, right? Like um, every problem is uh, represented in some sort of layer, you know, like as an application layer uh, developer, you look at the real world, you know, and model things in terms of objects or data structures. And then you have APIs that manipulate those data structures, right? So when you think about like money, or you think about people, or you think about actions, like for this chapter, it's all about data, you know, and data is pretty much like the first thing that you want to think about, like when you are making some kind of application or website, you know, how will the, uh, the people who use the site interact with your site? What kind of things can they do on the site? Like, will they create like a user profile? Um, will they trade money, right? Like for, if you're gonna make like a Bitcoin crypto website, um, how will that money be organized, right? Like in terms of a data structure, what kind of data structures are you gonna use? Um, anybody here not familiar with the term data structure? You guys wouldn't be f not familiar. I know you guys are always super sharp, like sharp, but you know, just like for the, the heck of it, like the data structure is basically just kind of, you know, um, like, you know, in programming, we have different types of variables um, and data structures are a way to represent, you know, um, like a lot of this data in easy to understand formats, right? Like if you just have variables all over the place, then it's not gonna be um, organized, but if you had like an array of variables, right, then you can, oh, okay, this is an array. But if you have a tree, uh, right, if you have bits, you have hash tables. So then one step above that is kind of like models, right, where you're using data structures, you know, to manipulate uh, these models. So this is kind of like my big takeaway, at least for, um, you know, this section is that how do you want to represent like your data? You know, and then um, they get into like this philosophical um, kind of, you know, debate about like, what is the best data structure? <laughs> you 
you know, later into the chapter, how like there are different types of data, you know, structures, hierarchies, data model hierarchies. Um, you have JSON, you have XML, you have um, tables in a relation database, you have graph models. Um, it is basically right, like it, uh, these things are just kind of case by case. The engineers who kind of build the software, like determine, you know, oh, okay, like this might be the most appropriate, you know, um, way of representing this data, JSON. JSON is something I think like a lot of web developers are pretty familiar with because JSON is like uh, JavaScript notation. Um, it's easy to read if you know JavaScript. Um, it's easy in terms of looking at, it looks like a tree in some ways, right? And so like you can kind of say, oh yeah, like I can represent this relationship between all this piece of data with, um, you know, one single document. You know, so we can get into that. Um, I think like the last part that I really liked here was just that, you know, um, they kind of talked about, right? Like, so as you build out these models, right? Like the models um, are represented very abstract, right? Like we were saying, like either in JSON or XML or tables or graphs, and then lower levels, you know, even more abstracted, like the engineers have figured out how to represent you know, all of this data in terms of currents, pulses of lights, magnetic fields, and more. But we don't have to worry about those things because each layer really pretty much hides the complexity of layers below it, providing a clean data model. So these abstractions allow different groups of people to pretty much work together effectively. And people don't have to like get into the details of, you know, like if I'm working on the application and you're working on the hardware we don't have to like butt heads about like how things are done. You know, like, you know where you need to go to fix a problem. I know where I need to go to fix a problem and we can all work well together. But imagine if we all had to be experts on every single piece of the, the application all the way down to the physical layer, that would be kind of a nightmare to manage, right? So it's all about abstraction. Any questions so far on this section here? So anybody who has used anything other than JSON and XML as a HTML in the HTTP um, response format? Um, uh, in my company, we used uh, RPC with the custom uh, data model. RPC it's called, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So remote procedure call for client server and we have a uh, yeah, okay. uh, binary protocol. Okay, so you trans alternate you to HTTP. Okay, so now I was saying yeah. um, the um, the response format itself, the data representation uh, in a HTTP response, right? I have only seen JSON, XML, but is there any other way to organize data other than these two? Yeah, so it's, it's oh, go ahead, uh, and then I'll do it. Sure. So, it, so it, it really depends upon the consumer of the data. For example, if it is uh, a browser-based application. Yes, in browser, you typically see XML or JSON, but in XML also you have multiple variants, like HTML is an XML, SOAP is an XML. And the, the new format that we are representing is the data is in JSON because the client is a browser. But if, it, if the client itself is an application, it can talk more than that, right? It can also understand binary as well. Even browser can understand binary if you have a binary library to decode that in a way that 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 can deserialize the data and present it in a way that is readable by a human user. Like for example, all the binary data formats are for uh, where that client is the application. Like for example, two services are communicating over a binary protocol like grpc is one uh, rpc protocol but it's still built on http so grpc is still on uh, http but there are uh, rpc protocols which are built only on tcp on tcp layer yeah because http is the layer seven that again we have to go back to the osa model right so http is the presentation it is the application layer where application can understand data but where rpc is built on layer four it's all binary so you will have much more, it will be lightweight because you 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 are removing the overhead of three layers on top of it. So when you're talking data, when you're talking uh, two applications that are talking at a TCP level, 
you don't talk about header so it's it's very lightweight and also uh, the data is is not easy to understand from a human user so you have to convert uh, if you really want to understand that you have to convert in another form like for example we understand json we understand yaml we understand xml right if you really want to debug something you have to do that or there are some tools to even debug the binary protocols but generally binary serve for applications who can understand the binary protocol so before even json and xml right uh, in mainframes i i worked my early, in my early career i worked on uh, mainframes so they have something called it's a pure text but they have some syntax it's for cobol copy books right and that is again just a representation but actually uh, application doesn't talk that in uh, in the in the plain text they have another format which is a binary is called apsidic it's it's all on hexadecimal digits so we used to debug using hexadecimal we read those syntaxes we keep a book there or oh, this hexadecimal means is this because it's you can you can convert that and con convert into text and debug it but it takes a lot of time but you know we, we got used to understand those binary formats and uh, whenever there is some mismatch we used to debug that using the hexadecimal yeah good stuff i think um you're absolutely right like data is just pretty much like you know at the end of the day like you know it can be anything like you know like this is like the part that really kind of stood out to me it's kind of interesting how you know we moved um you know all this time like from like doing like tape cassettes like back in the 80s to um to like cds then you know to uh you know pulses of light like in those laser discs and cds and then magnetic fields usbs um and really it's it is still just you know at the end of the day it's kind of like you know whatever you use to represent like um you know the the ones and zeros that pretty much like translate into like our applications at the very end because ultimately you know that's what we are doing like if you think about it you're kind of like manipulating like you know some very abstract piece of thing you know and um it could be pulses of light it could be currents it could be numbers um it could be like characters you never really see it you don't know like what the computer is actually doing underneath the hood right like how it's managing all that maybe like if you're really working with the, that layer the hardware layer but as an application developer you're kind of using like um <clears throat> the uh high level languages you know and the abstracted languages to make all your queries and then basically it gets boiled down right into like these lower level languages that pretty much manipulate like the thing at the bottom you know like very very bottom like and um it bubbles all the way back up kind of like again with this little diagram here you're sending your you know your sql code all the way down right and it's going here and bubbling around in binary and returning some kind of weird representation that comes all the way back up. And it doesn't have to be like binary, it could be hex or it could be like, you know, um, some other way of representing that data. But as long as it makes sense, you know, towards each layer, um, you know, the data is going to uh, return back to you um, in some way that you can abstract that to basically, uh, you know, say, okay, this is how I'm going to make sense of it. So um, before we move on, um, just wanted to uh, gather the information that Srini and that Akansha was saying. So you, when do you use RPC over HTTP? Is it for uh, non-text binary data? Like if you're trying to stream uh, audio video or something like that, that's when you use RPC? Or is it um, is it that RPC bypasses the application layer and is directly on top of uh, the transport layer? So it depends because there are RPCs which are implemented even on layer seven as well. For example, gRPC, which is implemented on HTTP 2.0. But uh, there are RPCs, uh, most RPCs before gRPC, they are implemented on layer four. So why they use RPC in, uh, in uh, with respect to like, you know, layer seven or HTTP is, because if your application or use cases uh, needs a low latency application, right? If there are so chatty, like for example, if you look at any chat application, right? They are on uh, layer seven. So, so they are on layer four mostly because 
uh, because of the chattiness and because of those uh, low latency requirements, they use layer four protocols. Even in layer four, uh, also there are different types of binary protocols depending upon the the language uh, and depending upon the the data parsing requirements. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go on to the next part of the chapter here. <clears throat> write that down in the notes so <laughs> yeah thanks that is the real value addition of this group right like you can go here from um I was just here. okay hey sorry so i just wanted to clarify that um if you are building a chat application or something you would should be more near to the physical layer and if you are building an application where latency can be latency is not so much a concern, then we can build it on the application there. Is that what I get it right? Yeah, on a, on a high level, because see, building applications on layer four is not easy. Because, you know, you need separate expertise to build it on it, and you're going much lower level, right? So layer four TCP. But on layer seven, we have a lot of tools and it's easy to understand, it's easy to debug as well. And yes, you're right. If you don't have that kind of latency requirements, uh, application layer uh, layer seven is a better protocol. Even in layer seven as well, uh, you can do uh, you, you can you can achieve sub sub second and sub millisecond, right? But if you like, for example, even all, almost all of uh, trading applications are on uh, uh, layer four. At least we don't see that directly. But what we see, like for example, if you're seeing a trading application on a GUI, that's on layer uh, seven because the browser doesn't understand layers directly, right? But the, their backend implementation, they're connecting the database at layers. Even if you, if you look at SQL, right? SQL is on top of TCP. It's, it's, it's not a layer seven protocol. It's a layer uh, four protocol. But what you see is, uh, for example, when you do a SQL query, you still see the data in a plain text because the client is uh, deserializing the data for you in a plain text. But the actual protocol is implemented on layer four because you know that if you see most of our SQL queries are in sub milliseconds or milliseconds, right? It's because of the protocol implementation. Even Kafka or Redis, they all run on layer four because of the low latency requirements. So, are there different uh, protocols that are suited for layer four and different protocols that are suited for layer seven, or the same protocol can work on layer four and layer seven? They are different. Like, in, like for example, in layer four, most popular two protocols are UDP and TCP. But in yeah. layer seven, you have yeah, you have a lot of protocols like HTTP, SMTP, and yeah, but there, there are a lot of network protocols on layer seven. TCP, UDP, transportation, <clears throat> and it it'll tell you here on the side too. In fact, I'll I'll share this uh, OSI model .com link here if you guys are interested if y'all are interested but yeah most people work on the application yeah i mean if you are if you are operating on top of transport layer basically the problems that you are facing are different from what you will be on top of if you are operating on top of application layer right so http does not need to worry about dropped packets uh, it's all um, handled Correct. by um, the transport layer and like the layers above so yeah, the protocol, the yeah, the problems are very different, and so the uh, the protocols are also different. So there was this book that kind of helped explain a lot of this to me, and it was like written in a, as a child's book. <laughs> um, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, I'm not, you know. Um, advocating for this person or anything like that but I just felt like it was um it was a really good read like it talks a little bit about like you know um this OSI model like how the internet works um you know how um, scaling works a lot of the stuff that we're kind of looking in the book it's written as like a kid's story with like nice little pictures and stuff like that so this um nice. this will be really kind of insightful if you kind of read this along with the book you know like how we went from mainframes, which are considered dinosaurs today, you know, pretty much to like the cloud computers that we have that nobody really sees. So I think this would be a really good read if you um, are really interested in, you know, the things that are gonna be spoken about here.
Okay, I'm going to note that down in the notes. <laughs> so people can go read. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, like in particular, I think with this chapter, right, like the, the main things that they're going to really talk about are just kind of like the different types of um, models, like you have the relationship, uh, relational model, the document model, and, and graph-based modeling and how like all that works. That's kind of like the big takeaway I got from this chapter. Um, the big one that everybody knows for relational, um, or as far as data modeling is SQL you know, or SQL, as some people say, um, you know, just because like that one has been around um, forever and essentially that um, it's the one that they teach you in the schools, you know, like when you're going to like make some kind of website or some kind of software, uh, you use SQL to pretty much, you know, persist your information. Um, and SQL is uh, just basically, you know, tables, which is what I think most people are also familiar with because we use Excel like um, for business. Um, SQL is just more, you know, um, more like, you know, granular. You can do a lot more with SQL than you can with Excel. Um, but it's pretty much still just, you know, um, rows and columns, tables, um, and then keys that pretty much, you know, relate like one set of data with another set of data. Um, you know, as I wrote here, like, or as I highlighted here, uh, basically, this was pretty much like created by or proposed by Edgar Codd. So that might be a name to remember, you know, um, yeah, basically that um, it was a theoretical proposal, but, um, you know, by the 80s, SQL became the dominant one. And then, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's pretty much used for like um, a lot of tasks today, like um, you know, sales, banking, transactions, airline reservations, um, and then batch processing, which we talked about briefly last time. Things like customer invoicing, payroll, and reporting. There's a lot more, you know, that you can do with SQL. Like you know, obviously there's there's a lot that is used for every single industry. So. Um, so let's focus on um let's focus on like uh, for our purposes right when you are working from scratch like you are uh, developing an application there's a need for to, to determine which database to use right yeah. um most of us probably join teams when these decisions are already made so um so we probably i don't know i mean <laughs> wherever i went the decision was already made so this is a new new perspective so we should try to understand like what um when to go for what so let's focus on that like not the history and all right and yeah let the history be oh yeah yeah, absolutely. yeah i think um i think it's it's important to just to know a little bit about the history okay. because like you know um essentially right like a lot of this still is you know going on today right like the thing about sql is that it was a theoretical proposal and then you know they kind of um had other competing um approaches like network model and hierarchical model um and basically like you know from that right essentially like we got sql is kind of like the best one for at the moment that a lot of people use um but you know like still relational models are um you know always being challenged right like there, there's no sql which is super popular um, these days, especially if you've heard of like MongoDB, right? And so um, this is a different way of kind of like, you know, representing data. Again, that's kind of like what this chapter starts off with data representations. Um, so you have tables, you know, or tuples of rows and columns, but then you have like documents. And documents are pretty much like um, easier to scale. Um, something that's a little bit, um, you know, easier to duplicate. Um, and then, you know, it's also free and open source, right? Like long time, like SQL, um, especially the Oracle like ecosystem was very expensive for a lot of software engineers, right? So uh, going to your question about like, how do people choose like what, you know, thing they want to use or if it's already been chosen for us, like how to work with it. Um, 
a lot of that kind of comes because like people are already sort of just used to like using a certain type of software and so they don't really want to migrate from that or like they may have you know have some other time like you know work because i think like when you join like a lot of different companies right like you kind of are working with legacy work right or legacy code it's not like something that is built from scratch um but you know uh it's always nice to challenge like what like how you want to represent the data i think like that's kind of like the the takeaway i want to put here so yeah uh, so uh let's see here i have um notes about sql here the thing about sql is that you know if um you know if you're trying to store data sometimes like data that gets stored in relation tables has an awkward translation um, because like you're trying to translate like some piece of data in a, like a model that you might be writing in your code right like um, if you have if you're used to like model view controller and you're like you know um, writing like a person should have you know um, an id and like a name and a last name and stuff like that um, moving that towards and then like it has like complex like uh, you know subfields you call it like an entity moving some of that into an sql and preserving that could sometimes become kind of awkward so you have to use tools like active record or hibernate to pretty much um you know make the translation between sql to your your application code and vice versa um and so sometimes like you may not need that much work to just build an application it might be simpler to just do like a document which um you know could be expressed in um in json and so let's see here jump to this linkedin example and you can see over here that this is kind of like the sql representation right you have um a users table and I say SQL, but it should be relational, um, relational schema, right? You have users, you have regions, you have industries, you have positions, you have education, you have contact info, and all this stuff is like um, connected to each other by you know uh, foreign keys, um, you know, and basically, uh, you know, every time you want to pull down information for, you know, uh, somebody on LinkedIn, right? If we were using a relational schema approach um, it has to make a whole bunch of join calls you know in the background to be able to produce this data to give you this data whereas sometimes um, you don't need that much overhead right like if you're trying to scale right which i think is the point of this book um, if you're trying to scale up and you know have like a faster experience for everyone um, maybe you know you can kind of get a lot of this information in advance and represent it in simple JSON and then let the application handle like putting together, you know, the, uh, you know, the profile here. So uh, what are your thoughts on this part of the book or this chapter? Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a point on the history uh, I know history is a boring uh, thing, Namulia, but one thing uh, you get uh, a lot of insights from the history is, for example, you know, if you're an architect, right, you see how the technology has evolved and what are the decisions that led to uh, that led to the current state of the technology. For example, NoSQL, and uh, that was, I mean, because when when like for example, when we are building a new technology from the scratch, rather than using someone else, right? This will be really insightful to know how a technology. I mean, this this will open up, open our ourselves, how we can change. Uh, that was you know clearly depicted in in this book about uh, actually no SQL was there in the beginning. <laughs> Even graph data was there in mainframes. Right. Uh, today mm -hmm. we st we still have uh, the network model in mainframes. They are now still. Uh, you know, the, some of them have, you know, in the book, they have highlighted some of the technologies has taken a rebirth, right? And you see now SQL, SQL is there for 30 years. Now we are going to know SQL. And still now it was, it, it, it was at a stage where MongoDB was so popular, highly scalable. But now again, 
if we went back to you know it was not scalable uh, because people were still trying to do immediate consistency in nosql but that was not the point and they realized okay this is not the right technology and again they more they moved back to relational even in relational also if you see yuga byte which is having eventual consist immediate consistency in distributed database so all the, the, that history is the one which will tell you how this how uh, the inventors or the creators of the technology had made these decisions that was uh, that was really amazing the author has did a good job on representing that data i think it's not a question of sql versus no sql it's basically uh, what uh, your applications data format looks like right so and how the industry requirement has changed uh, that yeah. history it's yeah you use case wise also right so yes, yes. um like how often do you want to will you be fetching profiles uh mm. is there a lot of dependency if it is lot if it's all self contained then it makes sense to not use a sql and uh, uh use a document db if you have uh, if you have a lot of relations then even if you use document db you are actually uh, even like you know highly scalable solutions like uh, mongodb and stuff you're you're not going to get the uh performance that a sql would uh, provide because the the data lends itself to sql more than uh, more than others right so it's not mm. the technology itself so basically as a architect we need to have that understanding as to uh which one to pick based on the use case so exactly yeah 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 i mean i so like the, yeah the history the dates whenever i see dates right okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that dates makes us worry but they, they were talking more about the uh, the decision that were led to do yeah, this yeah. and 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 i always give an analogy of uh, no sequel versus sequel using a kitchen example right so in, in kitchen cabinets we put all our spices in one cabinet and uh, lentils in one cabinet rice in one cabinet i feel that as as uh, uh, a sequel if you want to make a, a you know a recipe you need to pull uh each of the ingredient from different cabinets so there is a relation right if you want to build something you need to pull from thing but i i take fridge uh, refrigerator as as a no sequel for example if you want to prepare if you want to store prepared recipes so you put all the recipes in a box and whenever you are ready to make a meal use that box and uh, use the recipe and make the food it's 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 it's, 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 it's I, i feel that is similar to uh, sequel and no sequel interesting <laughs> Mm-hmm. yeah the co- co location is is more uh, i think co- the the uh, the emphasis in no sequel is is co locate co locating the data right because not only in terms of representation like n- not only from an application standpoint if i want uh, a data which is stored as one json blob in the in, in the database that from a user standpoint he doesn't need to query different database different tables in a database he can just make one query and get all the data in one shot but even if you look at from a hardware layer layer also the memory is also contagious in for the, the document that's why it's 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 quicker to fetch and all the data is collocated at a hardware level as well right so if you are you are indirectly reducing the round trips that you make uh, with the database from application standpoint and also the read time the disk read is also quicker when you are fetching contagious memory yeah That was excellent. <clears throat> you know, that was a really good explanation <laughs> about kind of like, you know, summing all the kind of points we've made so far history and you know, um like just kind of how like the SQL and you know SQL kind of differ and you know, just ultimately yeah, I, I agree with you, right? Like I think like some of the advantages of JSON documents today is kind of it's just everything's like more available it's like one call instead of like multiple calls you know and um it's easier to just kind of you know i don't know if you were trying to say it but like maybe like it's easier to kind of cache in memory you know kind of have this available with an application it just depends though like on your needs like what where you're working i guess again like where in the applications or osi model you are working you know like what kind of data representation model you can choose um But I, I like this example here for LinkedIn. I felt like this would be another one of those things. Like they had the Twitter one last time, and then LinkedIn this time. Just kind of, um, you know, that would be kind of a question, I guess, like at an interview, or how would you build LinkedIn, right? Like what kind of um, data, you know, uh, 
would you, how would you represent the data? And that might be like a question in itself. Like, would you use SQL or would you use no SQL or like some other kind of representation from you know, history? Um, so, you know, I think. Um, what is your stake? Uh, for, I mean, I think he has represented it as a uh, SQL. But I think it is more, I think uh, uh, document uh, DBs also do decent job SQL. because common use cases uh, displaying the LinkedIn profiles, right? Rather than... So um, it, may, it may be useful, I think, at one of these, um, you know, talks. I have a friend who works at LinkedIn. Maybe we can, like, just kind of get, like, a general sense of, like, what they do there. Um, without you know revealing any company secrets but <laughs> i'm pretty sure it'd be kind of fun to just kind of have them like talk about you know some of this stuff and probably ask at some point and and uh, i mean not uh, like if, if you look at the, from from the context that you're looking at it right if you look at from an overall application standpoint there will be use cases for both sql and no sql uh, but if you look at from a single component standpoint uh, the more fine grain you go, you'll figure out what would be the best use case or what would the best uh, database. For example, where uh, I, I actually, I kind of made a decision to switch from SQL to NoSQL. And again, I reverted the decision, but still I need that NoSQL capabilities, right? Even in, in SQL relational RDBMS databases also today support some type of uh, document storages. For example, now there is a new data type. Uh, it's not new. It was new for me when I came to know the uh, blob data type where you can store it's still a relational where you can store the whole uh, document right and not only that one right uh, you can also query some databases provides that within that blob also you will have uh, i see in sql server azure sql server they provide a capability to not only query the relational but also you can query the blob as well using json parsers and uh, this is one thing, right? No SQL is, is a misnomer, actually. There will be, uh, they, they think that, that there is no schema or something like that, or no structure for it. It depends upon where you are enforcing the schema. For example, most of the times, uh, when I, it's like, I, I, recently I didn't work on No SQL, but when I started working, there was no schema on the database side. But still, but if you look at from a user standpoint, right? When the user en enters the input, the data, you still validate that. And when you're retrieving the data also, before you insert, right? Like in, in NoSQL DBs, what they generally do is the schema will not be enforced by the database, unlike relational, right? You, relational, you have the schema, you have a schema, schema is also on the database side and schema will be enforced whenever you insert or whenever you make the changes. But in NoSQL, the advantage is there is no schema so that you, you have a flexibility to change the data model whenever you want. But also it doesn't have a schema, but generally applications will enforce the schema. That's, they call it as, uh, write on schema or read on schema or something. That means before you write, you enforce a schema uh, on the application side. But in RDBMS, uh, it, it's like whenever you do any changes on RDBMS, the schema will be enforced by the server side. Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, here there is no doc, um, DB side validation. Even for, so we in our, in our um, day job, like uh, we use uh, DDB document. Um, uh, uh, DDB, we call it DDB, Dynamo or DB, right? Dynamo. Hmm. So uh, there is no validation. Uh, there is uh, like you. Um, uh, there is uh, when they say there is no validation, there is minimal validation even on writes. So hmm. uh, like for example, you define some key. Um, there, there are like couple of keys with which the records are um, um, uh, are fetched, right? So the rest of the schema is flexible. You can uh, drop uh, fields. You can add new fields. It doesn't matter. So, but the two, um, the it's called hash key and the partition key. So those two things are needed. Um, so it is kind of good. But then I have also seen use cases where we have to kind application has to uh, load other uh, tables in order to present the full picture of the of a record, right? So. Uh, that was particularly, uh, those are particularly the use cases where there's huge latency. Now the application has to go to two different tables and has to, uh, you know, the latency is, add, is getting added at every layer, right? So um, you are getting those latencies 2x uh, when, from the application perspective. So, um, yeah, so you have to be very careful when you are dealing with yeah. because of the flexibility it provides you. You could make mm -hmm. the wrong decision and worsen the performance. 
And and also because database decision is once you take a decision, right? It's very tough to change. Yeah. You know, right? But now th there are some uh, you know I I call it as middlewares uh, to solve these problems, right? Uh, in in database also you have, for example, even in relational also, right? Whatever the structure that you have built the table, they may not be sufficient in in future, right? Where you will get uh, new uh, new use cases where your tables are not sufficient, but at the same time, it doesn't make a valid case to create a new table or a new schema. What they do is they create a materialized view, uh, depending upon the use case. Uh, they, they combine the multiple, instead of fetching data from the multiple tables, they create a materialized view where, where you can uh, aggregate all the tables and create one materialized view based upon the use case. That is within the database. Even some databases provide that kind of feature. And there are some middle layers itself, like you, you like the way you have API gateway between your client and our servers. Even in in databases, also you can have middleware where they can build a semantic layer. For example, we have data both in SQL, uh, RDBMS, and you have data in uh, NoSQL. But now you want to build a relational on aggregating both of these data. So you can build a semantic layer depending upon the use case. So this guy manages that new data structure, new data. Like for example, if you want to build a graph database on top of relational and document DB, you can still build it. So this graph will be an abstraction, but behind the scene, it will take the burden of uh, doing the NoSQL queries and SQL queries uh, for the data sources. You're removing earlier before this middleware, all this burden is on applications like ORM, right? What ORM is doing is instead of making developers write the raw SQL statements, it is creating that abstraction layer. You don't need to worry about learning about SQL syntaxes or learning about, because that itself is a separate subject, right? So ORM framework started uh, acting as an abstraction layer. You think about everything as objects as you're working. Even you think database tables as an objects or entities, right? Hibernate framework or this uh, these ORM frameworks will take care of this mapping. Similarly now, so now the burden is on the application layer, right? But now there is a shift also that's coming, making it simpler rather than uh, application taking that burden we can move to a middle layer. Still, you can solve the problem without touching the database and without touching the application. You can insert a middle layer, but you also have to take care about how much of latency that it is adding. There is always a trade-off, right? Latency in actual transaction or in latency in developing the product itself. Or like, you know, if, if, if you want to quickly deliver a product, you don't want to deal with it, you, you bring in a new tool which can take off it. And it's okay with a little bit of latency, but you're saving the time and the money and the resources in delivering the products. So what is this uh, semantics technology that like your like semantics layer, something like you, something that would abstract the details of relational uh, on the document uh, schema to the application? What was that like? I, I was thinking that ORM are all geared towards relational, like you can- relation. You can, yeah, you can take uh, you can take out SQL and put uh, Postgres or something, right? Um, I mean, you can you can switch those adapters and kind of uh, migrate data and change the databases underneath. That is simpler. But like, uh, how can you completely? Um, how can you write an adapter that can uh, talk to both Document DB and uh, SQL? Because um, that's maybe yeah. You already know it actually. ETL tools they are adapters to SQL and NoSQL. They get data from different sources, Excels, DBs, multiple different relational databases and SQLs, or even a, a blob storage like a, you know S3 or Azure storage or something like that. So recently I was working with a vendor, a startup company. Uh, we, we were using Power BI and we have this da uh, data in different sources, Oracle and uh, the Azure blob storage like S3. And Azure provides a, an abstraction layer called Synapse where it can fetch the data from both uh, RDBMS and Azure storage, and it represents one data model. So developers create a data model in Synapse, and that data model, the Synapse has to fetch, the middle layer has to fetch the data from different sources. So it was not performant enough. So we were working with a startup company where they, they built this one uh, a completely uh, agnostic database or a middle layer where it can talk to multiple data sources. The ETLs also basically does the same thing, right? It will provide you a one SQL interface for the non-relational data as well. Right. Yeah. Makes sense for ETL jobs because latency is not a concern. I mean, uh, yeah. it's not. Uh, it's they are not super sensitive to latency like uh, the web applications are. Right. Um, is that right? 
are a- etl uh, uh, they are all running as a background worker so they are not as it depends uh, it, 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 for etl i think in the first lesson throughput is important that lead in serious one yeah. um, yeah. yeah i used to work in api gateways in when i was working in ct my api gateway was not only uh, abstracting the apis we were also pulling the data from both mongodb and also we, it had connectors that api gateway has connectors to both rdbms and nosql and we created a, a, a data model that is required by our front end client application interesting good stuff i i think um, you know we should probably have this part of the video like uh, recorded again or like you know go over it again because i think there might be some good notes that we want to put in the you know the document that we have the working document um you know again like i, I appreciate all the you know um, input about like differences between you know picking sql and you no know, sql models which one makes more sense for you know the company and i think that's really the point right like just kind of like latency you kind of talked a lot about that like um how do you want to handle that kind of latency and where uh, which layer so i think again like just maybe just writing some notes for what we kind of discussed there that would be pretty good like afterwards yeah what, so basically the takeaway is that um um you could write uh, basically middleware that can abstract away the details about the database and um, yeah that's that's basically what depending on the use case it's possible to use both it, it's not a one way door is what if you look at even mongodb right or even no sql databases uh, they started with uh, it's no relational you pull the data everything is localized if you want an entity you can directly pull it right but some of those no sql databases are also providing a sql interface you can query because for example if, if you if you need a if you need an object which is a combination of two entities which like for example you have two json documents right so, uh, separate entities are stored in a no sql db but you want a json document which uh, which is an aggregated results of both of these documents so these no sql vendors they started providing sql interface because sql is very popular and it's easy to understand right it's it's, it's uh, there's there's not a big of learning curve to understand that query language right so they're providing even a sql interface to do relational like queries on no sql as well like if you want to query on two documents on two do- two similar documents or two separate documents or on the whole uh, bucket itself interesting i i didn't know about this because we could use such a thing in our application yeah um I'm going to just keep us focused like on moving forward though um I think like you hit all the points though you said locality which is again like just having the data you know um like closer to you you know like it's uh, essentially you know like um all in one place rather than multiple queries but he also talked about schema which I think you know uh JSON doesn't really have schema whereas SQL does you know especially if you use URM hibernate or any of those technologies it kind of enforces schema which throws a lot of people off um you know like that start working with no sql at the beginning but you can um no sql is more like these documents is more just kind of like the same as like if you're working with web right like you have like a document object model for the web you have a document object model for you know um your your data for your back end so um tree structures again data structures are um pretty useful for uh, having one to many relationships right hierarchies and so this particular data structure tends to be a pretty um question right um uh, sorry to you. so uh but like last question okay so how does this uh, sql so basically how is the sql used in um, in uh, in market right like is it uh, used as is it so it, is it uh, offered as a sql as a service or like in a distributed architecture right like uh, how do um if your sql is running on some remote server and uh, is the, is that how it works like uh, it's running on some remote server and all your uh, uh, application hosts are talking to uh, talking to it as a service or uh, is is it uh, is it like you have a copy of the um, of the db on each of these 
hosts and like they are kind of sync uh, in some you know master child kind of um, architecture model how do, how is it uh, deployed in the um, in, in, in general just yeah. so i mean uh, see uh, whether it's SQL or no SQL, all this uh, all these technologies are distributed technologies, right? Because you have to also have to talk about. I mean, whether it's it's a SQL or no SQL, you still have those uh, requirements of high availability, resiliency, and depending upon the use case, especially SQL versus in no SQL. So, from a business standpoint, right? SQL gives you immediate consistency, whereas no SQL is eventual consistency. But if you have a data like, for example, uh, banking or financial or trading, you cannot use something like NoSQL because NoSQL, uh, by design, it doesn't give you it doesn't uh, give you immediate consistency, right? So, but you cannot store, and there are also physical limitations. Right? Why it became a distributed systems for a couple of reasons, right? You cannot store all the data in one server, and at the same time, you also have to be you, you need to uh, be redundant, and also you need to even with its in, within SQL itself, you also need to have low latent uh load latency queries as well like for example because you, you, you in sql you can do multiple type of operations right read write update delete so but not all queries are equally important right you, you your system might be read heavy and uh, write low so in such cases what they do is uh they, they dedicate few nodes for write and they dedicate more number of nodes for read so you can segregate the traffic between read and write but the data will be copied from every rewrite to all the subsequent nodes. And there are multiple architectures, even in, in SQL Server, right? You have, uh, we call it primary secondary architecture. You have multi-master architecture. Uh, yeah, th these are uh, popular uh, architectures. And now when it comes to like, whether, whether it's, it's on-prem or cloud, the database itself will be outside of the application layer. So they run on a separate servers. And uh, it will be run for sure. It will be run on more than one server. Let's, if, if you talk about like a critical application, right? The database itself runs on multiple servers and all these servers, but from a client standpoint, from a client application standpoint, uh, it will be front ended by a load balancer or some, uh, some gateway where uh, all applications or instances of applications talk to one uh, URL and that URL will forward the uh, transactions depending upon the architecture to the you know upstream nodes. Right. Yeah, I, I yeah makes sense. Basically, it's uh, similar. It's uh, it's offered as a remote service. I think AWS also has a relational DB. I think it's called Aurora DB or something. Um, Aur uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, Aurora is yeah yeah they have Aurora as well, but uh, uh, yeah the, RDB RD. Uh, uh, it, uh, Amazon has RDS, uh, RDS or something yeah, RDS. Their database other service, yeah. So, uh, where do these uh, uh, joins happen? Do they happen on the service side, and you get the rest, or like, are they are they happening locally, or how do they these joins happen? They happen on the data, database uh, okay. service itself. Yes. So that uh, that's uh, that is uh, RDBMS, right? So whenever you want to aggregate the data or join multiple tables, right? Uh, that is taken care by the server side itself. Because if you look at it, right? The SQL engine itself is a Java application that's written in Java. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it provides an abstraction. That abstraction is called SQL, right? Uh, but that itself is an application by itself. And all the, uh, the responsibilities of data manipulation, everything is taken care by uh, the server side. Okay. But I also want to talk here ORMs. So like what ORMs do is they generally don't do anything on the client side, but they provide a clean interface for the applications to talk in a language they understand. Like if it is an object oriented, they, they talk in objects. So you don't need to worry about joins, uh, all these things that you talk about on the SQL server side. Got it. But in NoSQLs, you take the burden on the application side. But even in SQL also nowadays, what they're doing is, because if you traditionally, if you look at it, right, in big enterprises, there is a SQL is managed by a separate team. Applications are managed by a separate team, right? But the requirements comes from the application side to the SQL team. Now, you need to be an expert uh, to design a database in SQL. 
now especially in our organization what they do is it's very challenging there are very few resources and uh, depending upon their skill set they they do a good job or if they don't they don't do a good job so what we do is some of the design decisions what we take is we'll keep the database as simple and we do all the logic on the application side for example store procedures right you can definitely do store procedures on database side but we don't do that because if we do that this is again this is not my opinion that's industry opinion is if you write store procedures on the database so you need a dedicated resource to manage that one and you also need uh, you know uh, you are tightly coupling with the database tomorrow you cannot move from one database to another database if you are writing something uh, you know database uh, specific uh, tools and what they do is instead of writing a short procedure they write another you know another service to manipulate the data right they have different strategies yeah okay um it's uh 8 30 so maybe we can kind of stop here um i think maybe like uh we got the gist of this section here there's still a lot to cover um one thing that i wanted to just kind of point out here is that the last part where you were talking about abstraction and you know using a Java engine um, and how SQL works under the hood um, was that they kind of instead of using like iterative um, or imperative code for us to work with you know their their technology their API which we would see here something like this um, they use more of a relational kind of um, algebra x, x way of uh, writing their code which here you can see from family sharks um, of type animals, right? Uh, return back you know, the sharks, right? And so that's kind of like what they did here with the SQL language, select all from animals where families equal the sharks. Um, you know, I felt like this was a good section. If you want to read ahead a little bit, or maybe you've already read this part or highlight this part, um, imperative code is really hard to paralyze. Um, whereas like if you have, you know, more declarative language, like CSS is also kind of a declarative language. It's easier to, um, you know, work with. Um, it's easier for the machine to also not have to worry about like imperative details. Um, as you can see here, it's also an easier language to work with. So I think, um, you know, uh, this is probably a really good section to just kind of go through. Yeah. Bring everything together, but it's a little bit later in the chapter. Um, and so like, I feel for next time, you know, we can get to this point, um, as well as, uh, you know, we can talk about kind of like the downsides of, you know, document, uh, databases, um, particularly like, uh, them being sort of weak at many to one and many to many relationships. Yeah. Yeah. But let's not rush. Okay. So there's no, I mean, just wanted to, yeah, I know I asked a lot of questions, but no worries. It is technical stuff, right? Like um, it's better to take time and understand rather than uh, aim at finishing whatever in like you know in a in a class. I think the value is in spending time understanding. Sure, absolutely. And, and this chapter, I, I really like, and uh, you know, I think if I have to say, this is a must to understand or to design data, really data in intense intensive applications. Yeah, just like the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a good chapter. Um, I think we can stop here and uh, you know just basically resume on Monday. Monday uh, or Wednesday? Let's do Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, I was just about to ask this question, like as yep. a follow up. So, uh, does everybody here want Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday, ten thirty. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, that would be the 7.30 my time, um, Pacific Standard Time. But I guess uh, if you're an IST, maybe 10.30. I'm not sure. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah. So we'll I will be ready to talk uh, next class, um, Jay. Yeah, no worries. Today I had to kind of hide in like another room because, uh, again, like I said, we have the uh, Long Beach race going on here. Um, you know, it's uh, every year there's an Acura race if you're interested, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, just essentially like the race cars are so loud that I have to move to another room. So anyway, uh, I can I can continue to like proctor this. I just thought like maybe you know, like eventually, um, you know, if people wanted to like kind of split it up, um, we'd be totally okay with sharing that role. But um, yeah, we can figure this out next week on Wednesday. Okay.
All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you all. Yeah. Bye.